All right, friends, good morning. Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you do not have a Bible, we have a Bible in the back table right behind our sound booth. And if you do not own one, it is our gift to you. Uh, we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, so it's in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Uh, 1 Samuel will be right there. So it's towards the top quarter of the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 17. If we had not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Kenson. I serve as the pastor here at Bridgeport. Uh, honored to be with you all this morning and open up God's word. Uh, Megan and Grace, thank you for all your hard work with Vacation Bible School. And the Lamb family, we will do our part and give you those toilet paper rolls. We will, we will get it done for you this week, all right? You can count on that. Now, before we jump into our sermon, I want to remind you to keep up with our summer outreach initiative in the art of neighboring. Kate just had a chance to pray for that. You know, when Jesus calls us to love our neighbors, the first place that it begins should be with our literal neighbors. And our goal is to fill out this block map with all the names of people who live right next to us and bless them. You know, a few weeks ago, Susan cut up some extra watermelon and we passed it out to our neighbors. In the process, we found out that one of our neighbors was allergic to watermelon, so that didn't work out so well. Uh, for another neighbor, my kids got to see their beautiful garden. And for another neighbor, uh, we found out that their dog of 13 years just passed away and we were able to extend care to them. This is the art of neighboring. It's taking intentional steps of engagement to show the love of Jesus. Later today from 4 to 6 p.m., we're actually going to be in Wilson Park having our summer fellowship, just chilling out, having a picnic, playing some volleyball, grass volleyball. If you guys have a neighbor to invite, invite them out to that. As the Apostle Paul says in the book of Ephesians, let's make the most of every opportunity. Now, today we continue in our summer sermon series, Great Stories. Each week we're going to be looking at a selected Old Testament narrative and how it points to the greatest story, the story of redemption, the story of Jesus. And today we're going to be looking at one of the most famous and also one of the most misunderstood stories in the Bible, David versus Goliath. Now, let me start with this. Martin Luther King Jr. admitted to being paralyzed by fear. On this night, he got off a phone call, and the voice on the other end of the phone threatened to take his life and destroy his home. And after he hung up the phone, he sat down in the darkness of his kitchen, poured some coffee, and planned of all the ways that he could leave Montgomery, Alabama. The threats on his family was a constant anxiety, and it was becoming too much. He could no longer take it. But there on his kitchen table, he confessed his fear to God and in that moment heard a second voice. Stand for truth. Stand for justice. I will be with you even to the end of the world. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That night, he said he heard the voice of God. That night, Martin Luther King Jr., Bound courage. You know, there's a statement about courage that says, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than your fear. That's what we want to talk about today. Now, right now, there are many voices, just like there was from Martin Luther King Jr., where there are voices speaking into our lives, pressuring us to perform, calling us to be the slave of other people's opinions. It's, it might be the voice of our past weighing us down. It might be the voice of peers or our parents comparing us to other people. It might be the voice of our enemies who demoralize, demoralize us. Or, or it's the voice of Satan who would love nothing more than to keep us from following God. There are many voices that are speaking into our lives right now. And in the midst of all of them, there is the voice of Jesus Christ. And he is calling us to follow him and to pick up our cross. Yes, there will be hardships. Yes, there will be oppositions. There will be difficulties. It will be countercultural. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. Walk the narrow path. Here's the question I have for us this morning. Which voice has gripped your heart? Which voice are you following? Whichever voice you're listening to will determine how you move forward. It will determine how you will make choices this week, this day, and how you will move out in faith. 
Now, let me just say that it's really ironic that we're speaking on courage today because I am not a naturally courageous person. I'm scared of heights, scared of roller coasters, I'm scared of spiders, I'm scared of clowns, I'm scared of whole milk, okay? I'm scared of rejection, I'm scared of awkwardness, I'm scared of what people might think of me, I'm anxious to share my faith with my neighbors. I'm not naturally a brave person, and maybe some of you can relate. But let me just say, today, we're not talking about natural courage, but supernatural courage given by the Holy Spirit. And if we want to grow in Christ, if we want to see breakthrough happen, we need this courage. For example, if you want to grow in generosity, there will be a time where you will hit your lid where you're scared to give to a point where it's going to affect your lifestyle, you need courage to grow in that sacrifice. If we want to grow in evangelism, we will experience the fear of talking to others. If we want to grow in this area of our life, we need courage to share. For some of us who are hurting, if you want to grow in your healing, there will be fear to that. There will be fear to go into others for help, but you need courage to be vulnerable. Do you see? Courage is kind of this hinge on all the other virtues depend on. Because without courage, you're not going to experience that breakthrough. You're not going to experience the life that God has for you. You need the supernatural courage. This sermon is critically important for our spiritual growth. You know, 1 Samuel 17 is probably the most famous story about having courage, and it's the story of David and Goliath. So let me go ahead and just unpack this really long story and teach us what it tells us about courage. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, and let's kind of just work our way down here. Verse 1 here, the story starts like this. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered Soko which belongs to Judah. Okay, now some background here. The Philistines were a people who lived west of Israel, and the Philistines were known for their brutality on the battlefield and their aggressive expansion across the east and west. It says here that they were gathered in Soko, which belongs to Judah. So we have to understand that in verse 1, we're not just dealing with a face-off between the Israelites and the Philistines. This is an invasion. The Philistines are making a move towards Israel. Philistines, they smell the weakness coming from Israel and their king Saul. Verse 3, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now the space between them would have been a mile wide. This was perfect for a battlefield, a mile long. Verse 4, and there came from the camp the Philistine, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span meant that Goliath was over nine feet tall. That is massive, okay? And just to think about this, and the average male during this time was only about five feet tall. So Goliath was literally a giant. He was twice the size of any man that was around him. Verse 5. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. Now, now notice here, notice all the language in these verses about iron and bronze connected to Goliath's armor and weapons. This was Philistine technology. They were more advanced than anyone else around them in their weaponry, weaponry and with the nations around them. And the weight of all this armor was about 125 pounds. Goliath was literally carrying a person on top of him with this armor. And the tip of his spear alone was 15 pounds, okay? These details are here to show us that Goliath was physically superior, but he was also technologically superior. He had the weapons greater than anyone else. So Goliath, when he steps out, not only does he look scary, but we also see that he talks scary. Verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. 
So what we have here is representative warfare, where one person would fight on behalf of the army. If he wins, the nation wins, and if he loses, the nation loses. So the stakes were very high. Verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. This word defy shows up a bunch in our story, and this word means to taunt and mock. It says in verse 16, Goliath defied them nonstop for 40 days. Day and night, Goliath would walk out to the battle lines and scream out, Give me someone to fight. As you're eating breakfast, he is standing there, Give me someone to fight. When it's dinner time, give me someone to fight. Over and over again, it was a constant verbal attack. Well, how did the Israelites respond? Verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul here, remember who Saul is. Saul was who the people chose to be chose because he was head and shoulders above everyone else. Saul was the guy that was chosen by the people of Israel to replace God. That through this human king, the nation of Israel believed that through Saul, he would guarantee security, make them proud as a nation. And what we see is Saul failing them. He sees this giant, he sees this hard circumstance, and Saul is discouraged and fearful. And the people follow in his example. Now in verse 17... The story begins to change. We're introduced to David. Now, David, who is called a young man, is probably less than 20 years old. Many commentators actually believe that he's closer to 15 years old, okay? Now, keep in mind, what were you doing when you were 15, okay? He's sent out by his father to bring food to his older brothers who are on the battlefield. Verse 17 and 18 says this. And Jesse, his dad, said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephath of parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring back some token from them so that he knows that they're alive. Now notice that when David shows up to our story, he doesn't look like a warrior. He looks like a courier. His dad sends him on a pizza and cheese run. David is literally a pizza guy. He's a delivery pizza guy. He's Uber Eats. So in the greatest hour of need for Israel, the future hero looks lowly and humble. Verse 23, as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of Philistine and spoke the same words as before. His words of defiance, but now notice the difference. And David heard him. David hears the mockery of Goliath. He sees with his own eyes how Goliath taunts and accuses the people of God and God himself. And David is enraged. Who is this meathead who is talking trash about our God? Verse 26. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And that's like some diss, okay? He's, he's giving Goliath some diss here, okay? And that he should defy the armies of the living God. Now notice the first words of David. Notice how when David sees the problem, he sees it from a theological lens. He doesn't see it from a natural lens, but a supernatural lens. Hey, we have got to look past the size of this guy. God has called us to be his people. We have a mission. He's trying to attack and murder our people. This is not right. And David just loses his mind. He is making a ruckus everywhere all across the, the camp of the army. His brothers are getting annoyed. And King Saul hears this. And he, he's got to meet this guy, David. Verse 32, and David said to King Saul, let no man's heart fail because of Goliath. Your servant, David, will go out and fight this Philistine. And let me just say, when Saul sees David, he's like, what are we talking about here? 
This pizza delivery boy, who does this guy think he is? He's just a baby. He has no battle experience. He has no scars. He has no tattoos. Verse 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, maybe 15 years old here, and he has been a man of war from his youth. David, Goliath is twice your size and has been fighting twice as long as you've been alive. He has socks that are older than you. You don't have the experience and skill set to take on Goliath. David responds, verse 34. And David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father and when there was a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard. Now, I'm not sure how many bears have beards, but that, that's interesting, okay? I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Notice the heart of David here. The shepherd who would one day be king. When one of his sheep were taken, David didn't say, oh, you know, oh, well, you know, that's a bear, that's a lion, you know, I'm not fighting that, you know, forget that. No. Look at the heart of the future shepherd king. He will leave the 99 to chase the one. He will destroy the one who tries to take his sheep. David has fought lions and bears to protect his own. Goliath is nothing new for him. Verse 37, and David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Once again, notice, David just sees everything so differently. He doesn't see the situation with natural eyes, but supernatural eyes. He sees the problem through the lens of faith. David says here that I have confidence in the present because of God's faithfulness in the past. The God who delivered me then will deliver me now. Goliath is no obstacle for me. And at the end of verse 37, Saul hears all of this and says to David, go and the Lord be with you. In other words, good luck being dead, okay? So David goes out to fight. And Saul tries to put his armor on him, but it just won't work. First off, David is probably way too short. It just doesn't fit. Secondly, David doesn't fight like this. The hero will not look like what you expect. David goes to the fight with his staff, his slingshot, and five smooth stones. And these stones would have been the size of tennis balls. These were not weapons of war. They were shepherd tools. That's what they were. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, David here, and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Verse 41, and the Philistine moved forward and came to David and the shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Goliath sees this kid and he is insulted. Is this the best you got? Are you serious? This scrawny runt of a kid, you're going to fight me with a stick? Am I a dog? It says here that Goliath cursed David. Now what Goliath doesn't know is that God says that whoever curses you, his people, they shall be cursed. So Goliath just got himself into a whole lot of trouble. And it says in Leviticus chapter 24 that whoever curses you shall be executed by stoning. Interesting. Verse 44, and the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. Okay, check this out. David knows what's up. 
He knows he's not there by mistake. He's know that he knows that he's not out there because he thought that the shepherds were fighting. No, no, no. He understands exactly who is in front of him. David says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Goliath, the problem here is not that I fail to see what's going on here. The problem is that Goliath, you fail to see what's really happening. You fail to see what I have. I have the armies of the living God backing me up. Verse 46. This day, David continues, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the, to the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that, this is the purpose statement, purpose of the fight, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Seven times throughout our story, David mentions the Lord, that this is the Lord's battle. He will fight. God will get all the glory. David knows that he's little. He knows that David is, Goliath is big, but none of this matters because this is the Lord's fight. Verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came to draw near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Verse 49, and David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Now this stone would have came at Goliath at around 100 miles per hour. So Goliath would have never seen the stone coming. But what's fascinating here is that every time Goliath talks about David, he only ever mentioned seeing David with a stick. Goliath never sees David with a sling or stones. Very likely, Goliath didn't see these things because David was smaller in stature. So keep this in mind. David didn't win in spite of being small. He won because he was small. David didn't win in spite of his weakness, but because of his weakness. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine, with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. David forgot to bring a sword. So what does David do? He ran and stands over the Philistine and takes his sword and drew it out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The very weapon that was meant to be used to defeat the champion of God's people was the very weapon that would defeat the enemy. This is the story of David and Goliath. Now, let's answer this question that we posed earlier. Where can we find this supernatural courage? This is where it all begins. We need to know who the true hero of the story is. Now, if you guys have been coming to church for any period of time, you have heard this chapter preached and taught many times over. And often you would hear things like, Goliath equals your fears or your problems, and David equals you. So the rest of the sermon was there for your need to get out there and kill your problems. Kill your discouragement. Kill your struggle with lust. Kill your fear of evangelism. You know, kill your sickness. You know, kill your financial debt. If David can beat Goliath, so can you. This passage is treated like, like a pump-up speech. You can do it too. But this is not the point of 1 Samuel 17. The point is not to make ourselves equal with David. Because when we make ourselves like David, then this story is about us and what we need to do. This story is not about us. Notice that in our story, David goes out of his way to make sure that we don't see him as the hero. In verse 37, when David tells King Saul that he could, delete, that he could defeat Goliath, he says, 
The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. The Lord has delivered me before and the Lord will deliver me again. It's the Lord. And when David faces Goliath, he says in verse 45, you come to me with sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. David knew exactly who the hero of the story would be and it's God. David knew he defeated this giant because the Lord, the true hero of this story, was with him. Church, in this story, can I just say, we are not more like David. Do you know who we are in this story? We're more like Israel. That when you think about this story and reading this, you would think that Israel, the people of God, the people of God that God promised to be with, to give the promised land to, that when they face this threat, that the people of God would be the first ones to trust God. But when you read this story, they are a mess just like you and me. Can I just say that when life is comfortable and drama free, yes, I believe in God. It is so easy to feel pumped up at church or in your small group or with all your Christian friends or when you go away for that retreat and camp and they tell you, go follow God, give your life to God, and you're surrounded by all these other Christians. Yes, I want to give my life to God. And then you come back home and you find out that, you know, your bank gave you an overdraft charge and you're like, oh God, where are you? I thought you loved me. How could you let this happen? You got friends and family when you go back home who mock your commitment to Jesus. When you go back home, the temptations continually assault you. The problems you had yesterday are still here today and there is no easy fix. Fear begins to creep in, discouragement and anxiety begins to mount and you begin to feel smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. For many of us, a pump-up speech really doesn't work. Because when our real fears come at us, we're like Israel. We shrink back in fear. That's really the point of this story. We're not like David. We're like Israel. We're powerless. We're helpless. And in the midst of our depravity and helplessness and sin, God does not send a pump-up speech. He doesn't send David to go, hey, come on, guys, you know, we can do this. Israel's number one. Let's do this. David is not there to get them to believe in themselves. He doesn't send a cheerleader. God sends a champion. He sends a substitute. God sends a man who will step out and fight on our behalf against an enemy that we cannot defeat. And his victory will be our victory. Do you see? What we need to find courage is not a pump-up speech. What we need to find courage is a hero who will fight for us. This story is not about you and me. This story is about Jesus Christ. This battle points us to a much greater battle. A battle not fought in the middle of a mountain, but a battle fought in the center of all of history. And on one side, you have an adversary called the devil who aims to destroy every single one of our lives. He is called the liar, a tempter, a slanderer, a deceiver. He taunts and he mocks us and our God. And it is his joy, it is his joy to lure us, every single one of us, away from God. And who of us can stand against the attacks of Satan? None of us can. All of us have been lured by him, wooed by him to defy God in our lives. And because of that, we have sin and we deserve death and judgment. So where is the hope? Who can defeat sin? Who is the one who can defeat Satan, conquer death, and who's able to give us new life? It is on the other side. We have an unlikely champion. He steps forward and stares temptation in the face day after day, year after year of his life, and never once gives in. 
that even though he had no sin to die for, he willingly chooses to pay the price of death for sinners. He willingly goes to a cross and is buried in a tomb. And when it looks like the adversary has won, three days later, our champion rises from the grave, Jesus Christ. This is where we find courage. It's not to trust in ourselves to go out and be brave and fight the giants in our life. No. If you want to find courage, put your trust in Jesus, the real giant killer. And it's because Jesus is our champion and victor, we can have courage to face our giants. Because the greatest giant has been defeated. The giant of sin, Satan, and death. So for example, the fear of rejection. The fear that someone would turn their backs on us. In Christ, we need to remember that you're forever accepted and beloved before God's presence. The battle has been won. You don't need to listen to these voices that tell you that you're not good enough, that tell you that you are not loved because there is a voice that tells you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. In Jesus, we hear from our Heavenly Father, you are my beloved son and daughter, whom I am well pleased. We can have courage in the gospel. Maybe you're scared of death or bodily harm. This is the fear that death will take everything good away from me. In Christ, the battle has been won. Jesus has took the sting of that fear of way by defeating death and promising us a bodily resurrection and to have a hope of eternity with him. We don't need to listen to those accusing voices that say that this life is all there is and because of death, your life means nothing. Instead, you hear the voice of Jesus say to you, don't fear those who can kill the body because you have on this one's because Jesus who brings the resurrection can bring resurrection to the body and he promises to turn whatever the enemy means for evil into good. We can have courage because Jesus has won the battle. Maybe there's a voice that taunts you after a personal failure. And this voice says to you, God could never, ever forgive you. Jesus stands as our representative saying, no, I have separated this sin from your life. I have washed you clean. That even though your sins made you red as scarlet, you are now white as snow. My mercies are new every morning. Do you see in your life every single day, there are these two voices always fighting for your attention. Let me ask you. Which voice are you listening to? What voice has gripped your heart? Is it the accuser or is it your savior? David had courage because his eyes were on God. And we can have courage because our eyes are on Jesus. Notice in this story that David is asking a totally different question than everyone else. And sometimes that's maybe the first step towards courage is you just have to ask a different question. When everybody is asking, how big is our enemy? And how do we have anyone big enough to fight him? David only asks, what does God require in this situation? David sees everything through the lens of faith. When everyone saw Goliath as a giant, David's like, for real? You think this guy is a giant? Clearly you don't know the Lord because he's the giant. David knew that Goliath was a dwarf compared to God. In the same way, we need to keep our trials in proper perspective. That as monumental as our challenges are, and some of you are facing some very, very heavy challenges, none of those challenges are greater than our God. For those who trust in him, the battle belongs to our God. Amen? Amen. You know, and to help illustrate kind of what we've been talking about, as we showed you earlier, we had a video of just last weekend and all these people who stepped out in faith to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. People who have made the decision that, you know what, you can have the world, but just give me Jesus. You know, so today I actually want to invite up Zoe here to come up who one of the folks who got baptized from Bridgeport to share her testimony with us. Let's give her a hand as she comes up.
Hi, my name is Zoe. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been coming to Park for about two years now, since um, the summer of 2021. And I had the great privilege to get baptized last Sunday. And I am grateful to also share my testimony with you guys today. I'm also incredibly nervous. So. <laughs> I grew up in a traditional, loving Catholic family. My parents worked hard to make sure my siblings and I were able to attend private Catholic school for a good portion of our childhood. As a result, I was constantly surrounded by religious people and traditions. However, as a child, I never really took my parents' faith as my own. I knew who God was in a textbook sort of sense, but I never really had a deep, intimate relationship with him. Nor did I ever talk about my faith or feel compelled to invest any further than attending service on Sunday. As I entered college as a young adult, I almost entirely stopped practicing any form of religion on my own. Of course, there were occasional times I would attend service with my parents, siblings, or friends when visiting home, but it felt more like a chore rather than a spiritual investment. As I struggled through college with my grades and mental health, I kept finding myself thinking that God couldn't be as good as people said he is. When my dear friend Ian passed away from aggressive form of cancer at the age of 19, I essentially cut God out of my life completely. I was so incredibly upset that he took one of the best things in my life away from me in such a painful manner. So as I continued to go through college, I found myself thinking how horrible everything seemed, and I blamed God for all of my sorrows. It felt like I graduated college by the skin of my teeth, honestly, and there I was, set up to go to graduate school in the city of Chicago. So I moved to Chicago in the summer of 2017 and started school at UIC in their chemistry graduate program. Quite frankly, I had no idea what was in store for me. Again, as life threw twists and turns at me, I blamed the universe for being against me, or honestly, whatever that really means, I'm not sure. I grew resentful, fell into bad habits that not only harmed my body, but also my mind, and eventually I just hit my limit of what I could handle. When COVID-19 hit our city, the darkness that was inside of me continued to grow and essentially consumed me. I personally felt that was my low point. In the spring of 2021, things just seemed to keep spiraling. I decided to make the difficult de decision to switch research fields in graduate school nearly four years into my program. This change in and of itself was overwhelming. However, about a month after switching research groups, I was informed by my primary care doctor that I had a large benign tumor in my neck that needed to be removed due to how fast it was growing. The surgery came with a series of complications that could take place due to its size and location, and I was terrified. To make things worse, a month after my surgery, I went through the hardest breakup in my young adult life. So there I was, single, heartbroken, confused, looking deformed with a massive scar running down my neck, and faithless. However, two days after my breakup, and a month after my surgery, I randomly called my dear friend Megan Murphy and asked if I could join her for service on Sunday. Her and her husband Graham were thrilled to have me join. Although I cried through the entire service, <laughs> there was something there that had been missing in my life for a long time. Through that summer and the rest of 2021, I kept coming to church here at Bridgeport. Meeting new faces every week was fun. And the sense of community that I felt was unmatched to anything I experienced in my life before. I can't pinpoint an exact moment when I came to faith, to be honest. It felt more like a slow growing desire through those initial six months while attending Park. But by the time that 2022 rolled around, I really started to prioritize my faith and being an active member in this community including getting baptized this summer in Lake Michigan. God is so good. I can't stress that enough. And after two years of coming to Park Community Church at Bridgeport, I don't look back and see a series of painful experiences that I went through in my young adult life. Rather, I see God preparing a soldier to go into battle. 
My surgery went smoothly, zero complications. The breakup, although hard, was necessary and meaningful. And I continue to take graduate school day by day, hour by hour, and by the grace of God, I am set to graduate with my doctoral degree this fall. I often look back on that phone call I had with Megan and wonder what compelled me to call her to inquire about coming to church. The only thing I can really say is that it was the work of God. Her and Graham's kindness, the support and love of this community, the friends I have made along the way, it's all a testament to the work that God does in our daily lives. I am beyond thankful and blessed to have such a wonderful support system here to help pray for me, cheer me on, and guide me to unlock new levels of my faith that I didn't even know existed. Getting baptized this summer almost feels full circle for me. It's a step in the right direction, his direction. I wanna say thank you to everyone who has prayed for me and supported me during t this time. Today and every other day, I will rejoice in the Lord for he has made all things good. And from now on, I can confidently say that I'm a, I am proud to be a follower of Jesus. Thank you guys so much. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this incredible story. God, this is not Zoe's story. She is not the hero of this story. Kind of anything we heard in the testimony is quite the opposite. A lot of struggles, a lot of disappointments, a lot of fears. But God, you broke in, you broke through all of that to bring hope, to bring life, to bring joy. So that God, that today she can come up here and not testify about herself, but to testify about her loving Savior and Lord. So Father, we thank you for that. God, we pray that there would not be a single day in her life where she would not experience that goodness. That in the highs of life, that God, she would know that you are, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And that God, God, even in the valleys of life, she would know that you are in the midst of all of that. God, would you be with her? And Father, we pray for our church here today that God, I know that many of us are feeling different things. There are different voices that we're listening to that grips our hearts, that bring fear to our hearts. And God, I do pray that you would bring victory. As we heard in this story here today, as we saw in David and Goliath's story, that God, that you would bring about victory, that you would bring glory all to yourself and for the good of your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're so proud of you.